Tom, wonderful to have you with us. We appreciate it. We want to talk today about inflation and interest rates, two issues that are uh, of great concern in the economy right now. The Federal Reserve has just enacted a pretty aggressive interest rate hike, and they are also starting now to dial down their quantitative easing program. We're hoping you can explain what's happening in both of those areas and, and what they mean for uh, the borrowing environment and also for the economy as a whole. Well, good. Thanks, Arthur. It's good to be with you as always. I'm looking forward to having the conversation. And given the uh, volatility in the financial markets, I'm glad we're both sitting down. So let's start with the June meeting of the Federal Open Market Committee. Um, people who follow business headlines all know that the Fed hiked short-term rates by 75 basis points. That's a very big hike from a historical standpoint. And uh, they indicated they would be doing another big hike at their meeting in July. And then uh, Fed Chairman Jerome Powell talked a great deal in his comments around um, the meeting about the importance of bringing inflation under control, the importance of price stability. When you look at what they're doing and how they're talking about it, what do you expect to see in the coming months in terms of the borrowing environment? Well, the Federal Reserve Board has to respond to the actual data that they're seeing in the economy while they're looking into the future and prognosticating. Uh, what they have realized in great clarity of late uh, is that they were wrong, and they weren't wrong by a little bit, they were wrong by a lot. Now, they're in good company. I was wrong. Most economists have been wrong uh, as well in understanding the way inflation would manifest the size and magnitude of how it would manifest and the speed with which it would manifest. And if you look at their projections from their December meeting of where they thought rates would be and compare it with now, you can see just how far off they were. The, the, that's, that's the tough part. Uh, the, re, the reality is they know and understand exactly what the law requires of them, which is to bring inflation back down to the 2% zip code. Uh, and they and they are behind the curve in that regard and so they have decided to their credit that they are going to have to work more quickly and more aggressively than they had previously expected hence we've had 75 basis points here which we haven't had uh, like this since 1994 which is 28 uh, years ago so it's a big deal uh, but it proves and demonstrates that they understand what their mandate is under the law and that their credibility and the maintenance of their credibility facing the markets is absolutely essential. So we can expect that they will continue to be uh, more aggressive uh, in the coming weeks and months uh, because they have to demonstrate that they can roll over this in, uh, this rising spike of inflation and bring it down onto a, a, a lowering trajectory so that they can keep inflation expectations anchored down in the 2% zip code and not allow them to get away uh, from them. Let's bring up a chart that illustrates something you just referenced, which shows just how quickly the uh, the rate environment has shifted over the last couple months. The bottom line here is uh, the median Fed projection for uh, short-term rates from their December meeting. The top line is where they are today. Back in December, as you can see, uh, they were projecting that rates would be below 1% at the end of this year. Now it's up near 35 When you look at this, just how surprising is it to you that the outlook has changed so dramatically so fast? Well, it's, it's pretty surprising. You know, human beings have a tendency to, to weight uh, most recent historical evidence and factors more heavily than data that's further back in history and therefore we have a tendency to think that what's going to happen tomorrow is the same as what happened yesterday uh, and what we've been accumulating here particularly over the last six to 12 months is a whole bunch of really really unusual circumstances that have never been put together in the blender in quite this kind of way you know a once in a hundred year global health pandemic that had really quite dramatic macroeconomic impacts in the country and around the world uh, the policy effects trying to address the pandemic have had uh, really unusual circumstances. The fiscal and monetary stimulus in response to that has been really unusual. And, and therefore, the, the, the robust growth as we tried to exit uh, has, has created inflationary conditions, which drove up, uh, drove up energy prices uh, and, and other commodity prices. And then you add on top of that the biggest, most serious, most large-scale land war 
uh, since World War II uh, in, 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 to, in Ukraine, which is one of the biggest world agricultural producers and exporters. Uh, and you have a nasty cocktail of inflationary pressures and supply side problems that we have never experienced uh, before in quite this uh, combination. So they have happened in greater magnitude and speed than anybody could have anticipated. But, you know, that's life. You've got to play the cards as they're dealt. And this is the hand that they were dealt. And as a response, the Fed has to do what they're what they're doing now. Let's bring up the next chart, Tom, and, and talk about the, the other big thing that's happening right now, which is uh, the, the shift from quantitative easing to quantitative tightening. You can see here the Fed grew the size of its balance sheet to almost $9 trillion through asset purchases um, after the pandemic started. Talk about what's changing now and how that impacts the borrowing environment and borrowing costs going forward. Well, part of the monetary response to COVID was monetary expansion, right? And one of the tools that they used was to, you know, buy assets, particularly treasuries and, and mortgages. Uh, uh, and that was an expansionary monetary activity. They have now stopped that uh, and they are uh, uh, allowing those uh, treasuries and mortgages to mature and therefore to roll off, which means that the size of those on their balance sheet will uh, will attrit over time. And what that means is we go from this being incrementally expansionary in monetary terms to be to being incrementally contractionary in monetary terms and adds yet more contraction to the capital markets uh, than that which is already happening as a result of their outright interest rate uh, increases. So when you think about everything we just talked about and you think ahead, Tom, about the, the, the direction of the economy, how worried are you or uh, about the possibility of a recession in the next year? And how likely do you think that type of development is uh, looking ahead? Well, uh, what I would tell you is I've been thinking about it and assigning probabilities to it for, for most of this year, uh, because we all knew that we were going to be in an interest rate rising uh, trajectory. We just didn't know how high and how fast. Uh, that is becoming much more clear. And because of the way that it's become more clear, that is increasing the probability that we will uh, deliver, that the Fed's monetary policy will deliver us into recessionary conditions because of its impact on, on aggregate demand, which is exactly what they're trying to do, which is to bring demand down sufficient to bring inflation back down into the into the two percent zip code. So, to a certain degree, uh, if we have a recession, it'll be a, a successful outcome of the intention that they have uh, to uh, to tighten monetary conditions to bring uh, inflation down. Their desire would be to bring inflation back to two percent and not have a recession. I think if uh, if you pay attention to the surveys of CEOs and and important participants in the capital markets, I think it would be safe to say that the that the probability of a recession in the next 6, 12, 18 months is, has continued to rise over the last quarter. It's probably north of 50% now, uh, and it's likely to continue to rise. The U.S. labor market, as everyone knows, has been incredibly tight over the last year, year and a half. Uh, what impacts do you expect uh, there from, from what's happening uh, with the central bank? Well, we all got, uh, among the very many things that we all got wrong over the last couple of years, one of them was understanding the labor market, right? If you look back at the Fed's or, or Wall Street's prognostications about what the labor market would be uh, when COVID was beginning, as people thought that we wouldn't get a, a, the employment, the unemployment rate back down to these kinds of levels for a decade after COVID, how wrong we were. Look where unemployment has come in 18 months, right? We have a very tight labor market and there are really important long-term demographic and structural reasons why our labor market is both tight right now and likely to continue to be tight on a through the cycle basis into the future uh, because we're not, uh, uh, we're not having enough children and we don't have enough immigration uh, to alleviate that problem. So on the one hand, you know, it's, it's good conditions for em, employees and, and workers, the ability to find jobs and the ratio of open positions to workers is very favorable for workers. 
the uh, the advent of of the kinds of conditions we were just talking about is going to make that a little tighter and a little bit tougher, uh, and unemployment will rise. Exactly how much it will rise remains to be seen, but it's very very unlikely to rise to very high levels of the type that we had in in uh, d during the early part of of the COVID uh, situation because the long term structural demographic story in this situation. Uh, is uh, is looking like it's going to be tight for some years to come. Final question, Tom. There has been a ton of wealth destruction over the last couple of months in the equity markets. The S&P 500's down 20% plus from where it was at the beginning of the year. I think a lot of people are worried that we're going to see housing values also start to erode significantly. Um, how much does that wealth destruction affect come into play here in terms of the economic outlook and people's behavior, et cetera? Well, markets are substantially impacted by the psychology of participants, right? I read my 401k statement too. You probably do. Most Americans who have uh, those kinds of accounts do too. And so uh, when they're growing rapidly as they have for the last couple of years, you, there's a positive wealth effect because you see that and you feel you feel wealthier, it, it drives you to want to take more risk or make more investments and, and the like. But when it's shrinking, particularly when it shrinks like the uh, S&P 500 has by you know 20%, it has a reverse wealth effect. You feel less confident. You want to take less risk. You may be less willing to make investments at a personal at a personal level. So here too, the the uh, the uh, the dog itself is the economy. The tail is the financial markets in general, the stock market in particular. So the Federal Reserve has no particular view about the valuation of the stock market, but they do have a particular view about inflationary uh, conditions. And this this uh, reverse negative wealth effect uh, reduces confidence and and uh, contributes to the reduction of, of inflationary psychologies and, and behaviors. And, and therefore, it's to a certain extent a, a, a known, expected, and, and a, not a desirable, but a, but, a, but a predictable outcome of the type of a, a cyclical turn and, and monetary contraction trajectory that we're, that we're currently on. And, and, uh, and uh, this too shall pass. I don't know whether we're at the floor in equity market terms or not. Uh, but but uh, we will get through these circumstances. If we have a recession, we will get through that too, and we will return to a growth phase uh, down in the future.